early in the morning, bringing the attention inwards is an extremely skillful and useful thing to do with the body and mind. As we've been doing our meditation retreat, it's also a period of Ramadan for our Muslim brothers and sisters. And as the priests praise the power of God and invite the Muslims of Malaysia to come and pray to the power of creation, at the same time we're also very interested to understand the universe. Most human beings have what is called a theistic religious view. When we have this strong grasping at a sense of self, and others, then it's very alluring, tempting to hope that there is a being that would be powerful and benevolent and that could help. Because once we think the body and mind as a self, we will face troubles. According to the Buddhist view, it's the karma of billions of beings that creates worlds and universes. And so, still under the influence of ignorance and delusion, everything we do creates karma. And can you imagine, in this planet, six billion human beings and even more animals. We can't see the ghosts. More ghosts than humans, apparently. You think of the amount of karma being created. You imagine this karma as an extremely powerful force. the power, apparently, to create universes. When meditators turn inwards, we're not looking towards heaven, we're not looking out into the world. In our own way, we're trying to understand the origin of creation. But in particular, we're interested in the cessation of suffering. And whereas most beings hope that if they pray enough, they'll be able to be born in a heaven realm and stay there forever, But if we apply our mindfulness to just pay attention to conditions, in this world anyway, we can't see anything that's forever. No thoughts, no feeling, no body, no form in ourselves, in others, even in the world. If you go walking, in the highest mountains of the planet. You can find fossils of sea creatures where the highest mountains used to be under the ocean. The whole thing is moving and changing. And there is nothing stable, unchanging. And so, Rightly so, beings who are interested in wisdom 
might well doubt the possibility of finding a permanent condition, never-ending happiness. The Buddha explains, in fact, the Buddha has conversations with very powerful Brahma gods. And if we were to meet one, you see the radiance, the power, the metta, the kindness, the compassion, you would see an incredibly benevolent being. And we would all have to humbly admit this being has cultivated virtue to a greater extent than I have. And this being has cultivated merit for much longer than I have. And this being has more samadhi and more power. Awesome. But it wouldn't be fair to blame such a being for creating the world. When you go to Varanasi, the holy city of the Hindus, a fascinating place, and the devout Hindus coming to bathe in the holy river, it's believed that if you bathe in that river, you wash away your sins. The power of Shiva, the sacred river, the holy river of Shiva, has the power, they believe, to wash away evil karma. And it is actually beautiful to see these people with faith and confidence and joy as they bathe in this mud-colored water and on the banks one has to be very careful to avoid the excrement and occasionally corpses float by but for the Indians with faith it's a holy river it's a sacred river and when you go to the place where they burn the corpses the burning ghats, apparently between 100 and 200 bodies a day, every day. You can feel something special there. There is something magical in the air. And so for myself, I don't doubt the existence of powerful, beautiful, Brahma deities whose loving kindness stretches to fill the entire universe. Some people might doubt the existence of some beings, but I don't. But what I do doubt is that such a being could purify my karma or my ignorance. And I doubt that such a being could uproot the power of greed and hatred in this mind. And so Lord Buddha explains that this is something that we all must do ourselves. The Buddha points the path and we must walk it. And so as we wake up early in the morning, turning inwards, having a look at the body and the mind. And the Buddha explains in Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination, the world begins with ignorance. Ignorance as to the nature of conditions. Purification of mind, liberation, occurs with the letting go of ignorance. So as we train ourselves to try to see the body as a form that arises and ceases, 
feelings as just feelings that arise due to conditions, change, status and time cease. And as we cultivate our mindfulness and we try to see or try to understand, try to know Consciousness at the sense bases, hearing is just hearing, seeing is seeing, smelling is smelling, touching is touching, taste is taste. And consciousness at the sense bases knows, sense contact. And in the mind, sense space. And we train in cultivating a clear awareness that can know these things without creating a self, or a world, or a universe, or a God. It takes a being like, or a non-being like, the Buddha. It's interesting that word Tathagata means thus come and thus gone. Thus come meaning having accumulated the most incredible amount of merit and cultivated the most astonishing array of qualities. To be able to see and understand all conditions. Thus gone meaning having understood conditions, letting go of deluded attachment to them and experiencing that which is beyond conditions in seeing conditions, knowing conditions, realizing the unconditioned and so those with theistic views who are looking within the conditioned world and looking upwards and praying and hoping it's not possible to see the unconditioned Realize the unconditioned if you are looking for liberation within conditions. And it's only the qualities of the Mahabodhisattva and the realization of the Samma Sambuddha that points to the deathless, the signless, the unconditioned. And in our own modest way, we get up in the morning and we look sincerely, interested to know, to realize, looking for the unconditioned, seeking Buddha. Twenty years ago, when I was a backpacker, I came to Malaysia and I had begun a daily Buddhist meditation practice, perhaps for two years, but I did not yet understand Buddhist philosophy or theory. I was beginning to study it. My entrance into Buddhist practice was through sitting meditation. I was very interested in calm, I was interested in finding some coolness, a break from the fire, the heat of my confused mind pushed around by liking and disliking. And so meditation was for me finding somewhere cool to rest. And later I studied and contemplated teaching, the doctrine, and found that it made very good sense and gave very good answers to a lot of the confusion I had felt. There was one occasion where I'd been hitchhiking up the east coast of Malaysia. I was extending my visa for Thailand and I thought I should see some of Malaysia. It was the first time I heard the Muslim call to prayer and I thought it was quite beautiful. 
chanting the praises of God, loving God, religious fervor, ecstatic love. In Australia, there's very few public expressions of religious devotion. And so I really loved seeing the old Chinese ladies waving their joysticks in the temples. And the Muslims going off to the mosque. But there was an occasion in a town called Mersing. I was waiting to catch a train. And the train was a couple of hours away and so I went for a walk in this, in those days, small sized rural town. And something very interesting happened. It was approaching the sunset and I stumbled across a very old cinema which had been built in an art deco style of architecture and it was called the Intercontinental. This cinema looked like it had been closed for decades. The windows were boarded up, the paint was flaking off, and trees, small trees, were growing in the roof. Some of the brickwork was collapsing, surrounds were not well kept. And it struck me as being quite beautiful, this Art Deco cinema crumbling. At the same time, the sun was setting and there was this red light that filled all the sky and it was very hazy. So the sky was a surreal, unnatural red color. And it was a bit baffling to the mind to see this, to feel this tropical air, hot, a bit sticky, to smell the spices, people cooking dinner, and to be looking at this Art Deco cinema with this red sky. And then there was the Muslim call to prayer at the same time. And then right at that moment, Thousands of sparrows flew into the sky at the same time. And these sparrows were swirling around this red sky. And the mullah was chanting, asking them to come to the mosque or to pray. And the cinema was crumbling. And a very interesting thing happened to my mind. I experienced quite a stunning sense of being exploded out of my usual perception of myself. My name at that time was Brett. Brett fell away because this somewhat contradictory sense impingement had baffled my conceptual mind so that this Art Deco cinema, this Muslim call to prayer, this red sky and these sparrows, the mind didn't know what to do with it, so it let go of its usual sense of self for a few moments. And what was interesting was in that moment, in a way, I felt like I met God some sense of magic, expansion, ecstasy, a moment of liberation from the usual perception of self and seeing stunning beauty. And so immersing 20 years ago, I had a few moments where I felt like I met God. But what had actually occurred was the different sense contact had 
confused, the habitual way of grasping, so that the mind stopped grasping in that habitual way and just letting go of thinking I understood things, thinking I knew my place in the world, just seeing the mind without thoughts, experiencing the mind without thoughts, not grasping, not projecting, very spacious, beautiful experience. But then we have to be very careful with interpretation because many people would say, I saw God, that was God, God is beautiful. But what I saw was a peaceful mind, just for a few moments, that wasn't creating a self. Put down the way we usually grasp the body and the thoughts and the concepts and the feelings as me. And just in dropping that, for a few moments, a sense of expansion, rapture, a perception of vast space. And so if we train ourselves in meditation, we can experience this kind of thing fairly often, actually, if you train yourselves just by seeing a thought as a thought, a feeling as a feeling, a form as form, sense contact as sense contact, and not grasping it as a self, not creating a self. That quality of knowing which isn't contracted, isn't oppressed. Quality of knowing becomes pronounced. Things that oppress the mind are let go of. And that which knows things as they are is very peaceful when it doesn't create a self. So Lord Buddha explains that ignorance and delusion and even the conditioned universe has no discoverable origin. You can't find the beginning. But he explains that the grasping at the conditions can be undone. And that when we train ourselves not to grasp and train ourselves to let go little by little, that confusion within the conditions and suffering can be completely let go of. Samsara has no beginning. But for the individuals who practice, one can put an end to samsara in one's own mind. So the Buddha says, so the Arahants say, His Holiness the Dalai Lama says very confidently that he believes it is only spiritual practice that is a genuine source of happiness. About one billion human beings no longer have a religious view. Many people feel that religion is a cause of wars, a cause of conflict. And many people believe that there is only this life. And when you die, that's it. This is a very dangerous view because if you believe that, it means you will try to squeeze as much pleasure out of this life as possible and probably become quite hedonistic. And you won't be concerned about the consequences of karma in the next life. But even with a theistic view, if one was to believe that gods create beings and that gods have equal love for all of their creation, then his Holiness encourages Christians, Hindus, Muslims, Jews, encourages them to love all creation just as the gods do. And if the world is full of beings that love all of God's creation, 
then the world will be a peaceful place. But if the world is full of beings that think that there is only this life, and the point of life is to have maximum pleasure today, and then there will be a lot of greed, a lot of conflict, a lot of hatred. But for those of us who have accumulated the requisite causes to meet with wisdom teachings, we understand that it's simply wise to have loving kindness for all beings. We need the world to be a peaceful place in order to be able to live in it and practice in it. And cultivating loving kindness reduces our own greed, our own hatred, our own irritation, our own aversion. So we cultivate metta for ourselves as well as for others and for the world while training ourselves in this gradual training to uproot the greed, hatred and delusion that causes us to be born in worlds. But it's a cause for great optimism to hear from great masters even in this day and age that the unconditioned is real and it's the potential of every conscious entity. The potential of consciousness which is deluded is that it can be purified of delusion. The mind can be purified. Greed, hatred and delusion can be let go of and what remains is an experience of unshakable peace. Whatever remains is that which knows the cessation of suffering and is no longer suffering. And apparently it's not a self. And it's not unsatisfactory, it's satisfactory. And so the Buddha, having realized the truth, points the way and we're all walking the path. And may we all grow in Dhamma.